following interview was conducted with Professor Robert A. Ben Kayser, Hubby Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus of Chemistry for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, June the 16th, 2009 at his residence in West Lafayette. This is part two of the interview, and the interviewer is Catherine Markey, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Professor Ben Kayser. Good afternoon. We'll start with you being Thank you. on the staff in the right. chemistry department. I, uh, I went you out. You might want to move just a little closer. As, yeah. as, yeah. as you may recall, I went, I had to go back to Iowa State for the summer to get my PhD degree. Uh, as Henry Gilman had said, I needed two and a half years, so I went out and uh, in the summer of 1947, I got my PhD degree and came back here. And immediately Henry Haas, who was uh, head of the chemistry department, kept his word and I became an assistant professor immediately. Uh, and uh, continued to teach here. Now, um, my teaching assignment was in home economics, as I told you. Uh, I taught the women in home economics. All of the general chemistry people who came to Purdue, as I told you earlier, had to take at least one year of chemistry, and that included all the women. And in those days, just about everybody in home economics were women. They too had to take a, a course in chemistry, and I taught that course. Now, the head of uh, general chemistry at that time was Frank D. Martin, and so I was, he was my immediate supervisor, so to speak. But Frank was actually, Frank got his degree in chemical engineering, and uh, he was most concerned about teaching the chemical engineers. Uh, we didn't have too many chemistry majors in those days, just straight chemistry majors, uh, undergraduate majors. But um, he said, well, you teach the home economics girls. And you know, he really couldn't care less about them, although he didn't put it in those terms. But to me, it was a teaching job and I enjoyed teaching and I really enjoyed those, teaching those young gals uh, what I knew about chemistry. And as I said earlier, it was a real pleasure just to see them come in very, very afraid of the course. And uh, then as time went on, finally they caught on and some of them left almost enthusiastic about the course. Some of them left just because they were leaving the course, they were enthusiastic. But uh, I did my best and I, I enjoyed it very, very much. Then within about a year after that, Henry Haas did one more thing at least. He hired Herbert C. Brown from Wayne University in Detroit. And uh, that turned out to be, of course, a very valuable person to hire. He was just making a name for himself in chemistry. And I think he came here at the time because Wayne University at that time could not provide him with funding and the, what he needed for his, his research program. And Henry Haas here promised him, I don't know what, but uh, considerably more, I'm sure. So Herb came, and of course, later on, as we know, he was a Nobel laureate. He, uh, I got to know Herb very early, and I must say, he was absolutely the best and brightest chemist I ever met anywhere, anywhere in the world. Uh, Herb was a real asset to our department. Although he was a rather prickly individual at times, but nonetheless, he was very nice to me and I learned a lot from Herb. All right, so Henry Haas, you know, he did this hiring and the reason was he had obviously money uh, to do hiring. He was building, he, building the department? Exactly. Uh, he had money, uh, state money, it turned out, because Hubdi, the president, refused, absolutely refused to do any kind of, rec of 
going outside for money. He said, this is a state-supported school. Every bit of money we get must come from the state. Well, that had long changed, but that was Henry Hubdy, uh, uh, Fred Hubdy's view. And uh, so Haas hired H.C. Brown, and uh, then a short while later, we had a staff meeting. Uh, Haas called a staff meeting. <laughs> In those days, there was nothing very formal about it. Really. You just got a, almost a phone call saying there will be a staff meeting this afternoon at 3 o'clock. So I remember going to that staff meeting, and uh, Henry announced that he was going to take a one-year leave of absence. And you could hear a pin drop in that room. And uh, he said he was going to uh, join up with a chemical company that year out in the east somewhere. I don't recall exactly where it was. And I remember one of the full professors who was there, his name was Roy Newton, he was a physical chemist. Although you could hear a pin drop, Roy spoke up and said, well, Henry, does this mean that you might not come back? And Henry paused and said, well, possibly. So uh, we then had an interim head of the department, and uh, that was an, a, an analytical chemist by the name of Dr. Guy Mellon a very decent man. Uh, he had reddish hair, uh, which turned white as he got older, but uh, he had reddish hair and a, a rather respected analytical chemist in his own right. And uh, so he was appointed the interim head. And I, I really believe that Mellon was hoping that he would become the permanent head. I think he would have enjoyed it, but he was only interim head. So we kind of bumped along that year, wondering just what would happen with Henry Haas and so on. And it turned out that Henry Haas resigned. He did not come back. And uh, the reason, at least the reason that leaked out was that Henry wanted to be president of this university. And when Fred Hubdy was appointed and he lost out, he just pulled up stakes and decided to go out in industry. He left here, he never did go into academics again. He took a job in industry. Our interim, interim head was Guy Mellon, but he wasn't in the interim head very long. After, after Haas resigned, Hubdy announced that the head of our department was now to be Earl T. McBee. Uh, Earl Thurston McBee. And I tell you, uh, that was roughly, I think that might have been around mm, 1949 or thereabouts. That's a date that I have in some research. Is that right? Yeah, uh -huh. uh, roughly. And, uh, you know... Wasn't he I, a chemical engineer, though? Or was he uh, more chemistry? No, he worked... He got his degree under Henry Haas. He was oh. one of Haas's students. Okay. But I'll tell you, I hate to say this about <laughs> the dead people or anybody else. He, he was really a, a very poorly chosen person. Uh, but he ha he was a friend of Hubdi's, and as I once said, loyalty meant so much to Hubdi, and he just picked out Earl McBee as the head. Was, excuse me, were that what searches he would make, could make a lot of the decisions as far as? Absolutely. Uh, it, in those days, there was nothing uh, democratic Would he maybe this. be in conjunction with, say, one of the administrators or uh, the department? May or may not consult with him, but oh, he may have. I, I really, you know, I don't decision. know. He I, made, he he it was just announced by uh, okay. 
there was a dean of science in those days, and his name escapes me. Sure. I did know it. I can't think of it. Anyway, the announcement was made that sure. Earl McBee, is, and that that really was an unfortunate choice. Uh, I won't go into all ins and outs of Earl McBee. I got along with him all right, and I was teaching home ec, and Earl left me pretty much alone. And uh, I, I was picking up graduate students along the way, young people that wanted to work with me. As a matter of fact, when I went out to Ames to get my PhD, I had already had two graduate students who said they wanted to work with me. Good. So, uh, what area was of the research studies? What was that? Okay. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly what. Oh, well, I. My area of expertise, so to speak, was organometallic chemistry. That's okay. why you studied Haas some, wanted under to some hire of these other people, right. and that's why he wanted a Gilman man, as sure. he said, right. on his faculty. And uh, anyway, I, uh, I, I too, so I uh, asked my friend Nathan Cornblum, who was one of the full professors here on the staff, organic chemistry staff, whether he would take care of my two students while I was out in Ames, because if they had any troubles, they should ask him. And uh, he said, sure. So, but I was, you know, only in Ames, they were on the quarterly system, so I was only out there about three months and came back here. But in the meanwhile, I was picking up more and more graduate students. Uh, these, I think, in part because I was a young person, and uh, they, they tend to gravitate more toward younger people than they do older people, I found out later on, whatever the reason. I did pick up graduate students. Oh, good. That's good. And uh, I, you know, the, oh, I was, I was in my glory. Um, I was teaching. I was directing research. If you ask me today, which did you enjoy most? I really don't know. They, they were both at the top of my list. Yeah. I enjoyed both, and I tried to do both. It was very hard. Most of the time, people would gravitate either to being teaching most of the time or directing research most of the time. By the way, H.C. Uh, Brown came here with the understanding that he was not going to teach, but he was going to be a, just a research director. Although he did ultimately teach one graduate course, totally, just one. Uh, but he did nothing but research. And, uh, okay, now one little interesting uh, highlight here. About 1950, there was an I say ACS meeting, American Chemical Society meeting. We had two national meetings per year in the spring and in the fall. And this was in the spring meeting, and it was in Philadelphia, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And uh, I was going to present a paper there. You know, you get up the you know, hall and deliver a paper and the members come in and out with their badges and they listen to you and so on. And we were supposed to do that. Uh, uh, McBee wanted everybody to really put Purdue's name out there in front, you know. So uh, I took one of my graduate students uh, who also wanted to go and he said, Doc, I'll, I'll, we'll split the driving. I said, okay. So I drove with, his name was Frank Reel, R-I-E-L. And we drove to Philadelphia. And uh, one of those days we were there, we were only there about four or five days and had come home. But one of those days, I was standing in the lobby of the hotel. And I looked across the lobby and I saw a fellow there I knew from Xavier back in Cincinnati. I hadn't seen him for years. It was Harry Gold. And I said, Harry, how are you? Do you remember me? And he said, yes, and we shook hands. Maybe I should remind you that Harry Gold was later known as one of the Adam spies. 
Well, anyway, the story there is that Harry Gold went to Xavier University at the same time. He was one year ahead of me, but we were both majoring in chemistry. And uh, we would get there very early in the morning. As I told you, I had to use the bus to go up there. I don't remember how Harry got there, but uh, I'd get up there about 8.15 or so. The classes started at 8.30. And uh, Harry Gold would be there in the classroom, and I would go in, and we'd be alone. We chat, and I found him a very interesting person, really, and well educated, obviously. And uh, at one point, I said, "Harry, uh, whatever caused he?" He told me he was from Philadelphia, and I said, "Whatever caused you to come to Xavier?" I said, "There's University of Cincinnati here, which really has a better reputation at that time." He said, "Well." I had some credits that I wanted to transfer, and University of Cincinnati, better known as UC in those days, sure. did not accept them, but Xavier would, so I came here. Sounded good enough to me. So, uh, <laughs> sure. I, uh, but then Harry graduated a year before I did, and uh, I lost track of Harry. I don't know where he went. Of course, he was very busy, it turned out, in the meanwhile. I didn't know anything about that. But I did meet him in Philadelphia. And uh, I said, Harry, and we had a, oh my. And, and I said, Harry, I, I've got to go to a paper over in a hotel, a named hotel. I said, I don't know exactly how to get over there from here. He said, come on, I'll, I'll walk with you. He said, you know, I know Philadelphia. He said, uh, I'll walk you over there. All right, so we go down the street, and uh, we stop. He's here's the hotel, and uh, I said, "Well, let's let's exchange uh, addresses and so on, so we can keep in touch." He said, "Good idea." So we both write down on separate papers, exchange these papers, and I go in, and well, later on, came back. I can remember about a day or two after I got back. I was st now we lived on Ross 8 Drive, building 21, apartment 11. I was married, my wife. And I got out of the shower that morning, and she said, Bob, Bob, Harry Gold was arrested. He's an Adam spy. I couldn't believe this. I said, oh, my gosh. And I said, there we were just a couple days ago, in Philadelphia and exchanging addresses. I said, I'll bet the FBI was tailing him all along. So when I come back, I, I told the head of the department, who was her own McBee, I said, boy, I met this guy, Harry Gold. And I said, I'm sure the FBI is going to be here to talk to me. Yeah. Earl didn't, didn't bother him too much. You know, that's the way he was. So sure enough, a few days later, the phone rings. It's the FBI agent. He said, I would like to talk to you. Let's make an appointment. Well, I, you know, so we came and I was pretty nervous. I thought, oh boy, where, where do I fit into this picture? Well, by the time, after about one or two minutes of the conversation, I was very much at ease because it was clear they weren't interested in me. They just wanted to know what I knew about Harry Gold. Background information. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and I told them what I knew, which was kind of, you know, we were such good friends that one year at Purdue at uh, Xavier, I invited Harry down to my house for Thanksgiving dinner because he wasn't going home, you know. So I have to remember him. He ate. He was very he ate heartily, which pleased my mother a great deal. And that, but that indicates how good a friend I was of his, you know. And I, the only thing I could tell the FBI that I said, uh, he always spoke about a girlfriend that he had back in Philadelphia. And I said, I asked Harry, uh, did you ever get married? And he said, no, I never did. So I said, you know, you might want to look up at whether he did have a girlfriend. I said, maybe she would have more information than I can give you. Well, it turned out they had plenty of information. Well, <clears throat> to refresh your memory, Harry Gold 
was the courier, so to speak, between Ethel and one of the Rosenbergs, Ethel and whatever his Rosenberg, name was. Yeah. And they had access to somehow the secrets about the atom bomb. And they would steal those, they'd pass them on to Harry, and Harry would carry those things and pass them on to the Soviet spy. So he was very actively engaged. And uh, I, I told my wife when I got back from Philadelphia, I said, you know, there was one thing about Harry. I said, he seemed rather sad. I said, he, he wasn't as, didn't speak as much as he used to. I, and that was just my observation. He seemed rather sad. Well, maybe he saw the handwriting on the wall. I, I think he did by that time. Uh, yeah. You know, it was very interesting. Uh, if you look on the internet, you'll find that whole trial is on the internet. It wrote Ethel, yeah, I forget the husband's, husband's name, husband's name yeah, was. But anyway, uh, I think Harry, I thought Harold, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he turned Harry Gold in that trial turned uh, prosecute. He was a prosecutor attorney's chief witness. He turned against the Rosenbergs and gave you know, and the Rosenbergs were ultimately electrocuted and killed. And Harry Gold was imprisoned in Philadelphia. This is all on the internet. I got it later on. Uh -huh. And it said he was a model prisoner. He seemed to have been bullied in college, in high school. And uh, he seemed to adapt very well to prison life. But he didn't, he died shortly after he was in prison. And that was the end of Harry Gold. But it was a sad saga. Uh, yeah, I imagine. And Isn't it ironic that after all those years, you just happened to run into him and then maybe it it you yeah, you know, right. it, it, it was a, such a, yeah. uh, as I say, you know, you would think that Earl McBee would have been uh, somewhat interested in him, but he wasn't mm -hmm. interested at all. Okay, now I taught the home ec students here until about, well, the mid-1950s. And one day, this shows how the apartment was run in those days, uh, Earl passed me in the hallway. And uh, he, he had a kind of way of speaking out of the side of his mouth. I said, Bob, uh, pulled me over and he said, uh, I think uh, starting next fall, you should teach chemistry 651 and 652. He said, Brian Bachman is teaching that now, but uh, I think you should teach it. So that turned out to be the plum <laughs> of a teaching assignment because it was what all organic majors had to take. It was an organic, it was a graduate course in organic chemistry. And needless to say, all organic majors had to take that course. The chemical engineers would send their graduates over to take that course. So in terms of quality of students, they were just at the top. They had to be interested. Sure. But I really worked on preparing for that course. I I worked harder than they did, I think, because, oh, I went to Brian Bachman and I said, Brian, do you have any notes at all that I could use? No, I don't have any. I think Brian was ticked off that he was not <laughs> going to be teaching him. He didn't have anything to do. So I had to work up my sure. whole course and I worked hard and hard. <coughs> uh, but they were a very receptive bunch of course. And, uh, oh, I, I learned more than they did, but... Uh, to it was good the, on both sides. Yeah. To tell you the truth, it was about a year ago, I was cutting the grass right out in front here, and the neighbor, I didn't recognize him anymore, comes over, introduces himself as Bob Perlis, and he said, uh, I was in your graduate class. I said, you were? Oh, yeah, he said, 
I remember you telling us about this guy who synthesized all these perfumes and things from Switzerland. And my gosh, I thought to myself, yeah, I did have that in the course. <laughs> you remember. Anyway, uh, once I got into that course, I attracted all kinds of graduate students uh, because these students had not yet picked their major professor. Well, you know, if, if you make a good impression on them, and as I say, I threw myself into that, and I, I was a pretty good teacher, I do believe, uh, I got some of the cream of the crop in terms of the graduate students. And honest, you know, in that business, the graduate students do the work, you do the direction. Uh, but if you've got bright students, they put their two cents worthy in too and say, I'd go visit them twice a day. I had good training under Dr. Gilman who'd come around at nights and weekends. And, uh, and I would go around, you know, and the next day they'd say, well, you know, Bob, or not Bob, the old Dr. Van Kesser, yeah. uh, I, I observed such and such, and I wonder whether what we're seeing isn't, and I always say, let's try it, let's try it out. And uh, actually, we hit upon something uh, accidentally, uh, which was perhaps one of my greatest contributions to chemistry at that time. It's a, it was a so-called name reaction in organic chemistry, which is now called the Ben Kesser reduction. And that was a, just an accidental discovery because I had at that time some very, very good, probably the best graduate students I ever had. And um, so anyway, I, I had a great teaching job. I didn't teach home ec anymore, never did after that. It was the plum of the teaching jobs and uh, I was getting some of the best graduate students, although Did you Herb have Brown both got sort of some better. Both, both chemistry and chemical engineering? No, just chemistry no, the chemistry. chemical engineers didn't do graduate okay. work in our department. Okay. They do go back oh, over yes. there. Okay. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I had the best of both worlds, the best teaching course that I could have had. And, I was getting some of the best graduate students and therefore I was doing some of the best research and things were just going along great. Uh, I, uh, I would say perhaps the darkest moment I, I ever had in my career and it started in the, uh, I'd say, about 1961, I had a graduate student, one of the brightest graduate students in the department, a straight A student, came to us from Harvard. I don't know if I should mention his name, it was Rex Grossman. And uh, he breezed through, I had a research idea and uh, told Rex about it, and by golly, it worked. And we published this immediately, put it into print, and boy, that made a big splash. Uh, because It was in organosilicon chemistry. I was now doing work in organosilicon chemistry as a result of my background from Henry Gilman. And, uh, well, to make a long story short, Rex Grossman, I got him, I said, Rex, you should be a teacher. He didn't object to that. I got him a postdoctoral appointment with somebody at the University of Chicago. And Rex left here, and went up there with his PhD from here, went up there to do postdoc work. And uh, in the meanwhile, I hired another I hired a postdoc from Japan, a Japanese postdoc by the name of Nagai, N-A-G-A-I. He it was a little hard to understand when he got here. He 
he still, he, he had to learn English, so to speak, but he was a superb lab worker, superb. And he worked day and night. He was a hard worker. And one of my own students, told, my other students told me, well, he said he had to work that hard because you were paying him so well. So anyway, uh, another guy, I said, Will you follow up now on what Grossman did. Let's continue on and see where this will lead us. To make a long story short, our guy discovered that everything Grossman had done was, oh, he had fudged his results. They were incorrect. They could not be reproduced. Our guy even hesitated telling me this. And I, that was a terrible blow. I... Uh, in fact, to this day, it's hard for me to see how he got away with that because I had, I was looking over his shoulder all the time. And there were other students there, too, and worked in the lab with him. They were doing similar things, and they, too, didn't detect this. Well, uh, Nagai detected it, and I thought... We can't give him a PhD. He's got a PhD, but it has to be withdrawn. I mean, it was based on just a fake, phony thesis. And so I went to Earl McBee, and I told Earl, and Earl says, well, if you decide to do this, you're going to do it on your own. I don't want any part of it. I don't want my name connected. I must say, the graduate dean at that time, who was Fred Andrews, said to me to, oh, Bob, don't, I wouldn't bother about that. You know, sometimes you do the things and they come out this way, and sometimes you do them and they come out that way. I said, Fred, this is an exact science. I said, this is not true. I said, we must withdraw that degree. And there was a very fateful faculty meeting of the, of the entire university. It was a university faculty meeting. And I will never forget that because I had to get up and explain to the whole faculty who attended that this was a phony forged thesis and I had all kinds of... He even forged the name of the analyst that carried out the elemental analysis. He put her name down, but he forged it. It was a woman, and she would look at, she would say, that's not my name. She was Chinese. She said, that's a, I didn't sign that. Well, you know, I never thought that he, anybody would forge anything. You know, it was, it was unbelievable. Well, you could hear a pin drop in that huge room, and you can imagine how I felt. And I uh, had to explain to them just what happened. And I said, it's my recommendation that we withdraw that PhD degree. And incidentally, that faculty meeting had another issue, which was quite important. St. Thomas Aquinas had requested of Purdue that they bring down a, I would say, a theologian or a philosophy prof from Notre Dame to give some courses over there at St. Tom's, just two courses, that's all. And uh, students who wanted to here could take courses like that for credit, it's just two courses. But that had to be approved by the faculty. And the fact that this was Notre Dame, uh, well, that faculty meeting, I'll never, never forget it. Here I am wanting them to vote to withdraw the degree, and incidentally, it was a unanimous vote for my part. And I remember sitting back down, I was just dripping wet with perspiration, and somebody behind me just patted me on the shoulder. One of the other guys, I don't know who it was. Anyway, this other thing was St. Tom's. Boy, was that a thorny issue. 
And I remember one of the faculty members, and I will add that there is a building here named after him. I will not mention the name, but I heard he got up and said, well, it's my opinion that when these people get their foot in the door, they tend to just barge in. In other words, there was great concern that we were gonna have some Catholic people here teaching these state school students Catholic. And that was something that, that was a terrible thing. Well, as you may remember, it, it passed. Even that passed at that faculty meeting, but just barely. And to my knowledge, even today, there's somebody permanently stationed over at St. Tom's that is still, I guess, a faculty member up at Notre Dame. I don't know. And I understand those co two courses he teaches are, are really quite popular. He's a good mm -hmm. teacher. Mm -hmm. you know, and I don't see that the Catholic people have taken over or the Pope is not running Purdue or anything of the sort. But I mentioned that that sure. was definitely uh, yeah. the low point in my career here. Uh, I, I won several research awards here. Uh, what about the uh, the Hovde Distinguished Service Board uh, for the let research? Me tell you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I won the Alpha Chi Sigma Award. This is a research award for the work we did. Right. I won the Sigma Xi Award, which was for research that we did. Um, and I, oh, there were several teaching awards that I won here too. Did you get the uh, Did you get a Murphy Award? The Murphy Murphy Award, one of those. No, I didn't. And there used to be there the was, I wasn't there. Oh, the Amico used to be the pre precursor to that. Uh, as a teaching award, you know that they used to do. That. I don't know. I'll okay. tell you, Frank Martin, who was head of general chemistry, when he retired, he set up a teaching award. It was called. So you got a lot of them within the department. Exactly. That's and fine. Uh, every time I became eligible for that, I I would win it. Uh, and Frank <laughs> was nice. very chagrined because I was an organic chemist, and <laughs> I was, and here he was, you know, he was an inorganic chemist, and well, anyway, be that as it may. That's all right. Uh, so, okay, uh, yeah, well, um, Earl McBee was just a an impossible head of the department, and I look back. The appointment of Earl as department head indicates perhaps the low level that we were operating at in the department with him as department head. And uh, he would, toward the end, he would hardly even show up over there. He, he would do a lot of consulting work for Great Lakes Chemical here in town. And uh, as a matter of fact, he became, as I remember it, the CEO of Great Lakes Chemical because Earl and uh, Henry Haas, they, they did work on chlorination and fluorination and Great Lakes Chemical, thanks to Earl McBee moving out there, they began to make some of these compounds and they were flame retardants and uh, they used them as fire extinguishers and this and that, and Great Lakes really began to flourish. But Earl McBee was spending most of his time in industry out there, not back in the department. He wasn't paying any attention to the department. Uh, I can remember it was under the auspices of, during the time of Earl McBee that uh, JFK was assassinated. And uh, we were having a faculty meeting at the time, and uh, I remember that Secretary came in, gave a little note to Earl. He said, he said Kennedy is dead. And uh, it was, so he didn't care. In fact, he said to me once, boy, that guy was quite a shot, you know, to kill him that way. Well, anyway, that was Earl McBee. And, but by that time, we had a fellow by the name of Phil Haas. Felix Haas was now the Dean of Science. I don't remember how the other, the other dean 
actually, I think he became an alcoholic, I don't remember, but he was replaced by Phil Haas, who was in the mathematics department here. And uh, he became dean of science. And uh, there was more and more, and Purdue was getting to be much more democratic in general. I mean, the faculty was having more and more say in how to run things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but one day, there was a, finally there was a group of us went over to Haas as a group, all the full professors with tenure went over. I was one of them. And we told Phil he really should remove Earl McBee as head because Earl didn't spend any time there. He wasn't interested. And he was doing a lot of things which was really quite unethical. And uh, I think Phil Haas himself never thought much of Earl. That's just my personal opinion. And uh, so he, uh, we told Haas, we should have a system over there that rather than appointing a head the way everybody previously had been appointed, there should be a, a, a rotating headship, maybe every five years. And then the faculty should vote, the, the tenured faculty should vote whether they wanted to, him to continue or whether they wanted someone else. Uh, and well, Haas, uh, Haas agreed to that. And I was told that Hubby was so angry with Haas, he respected this loyalty and he made Earl McBee a distinguished professor so that Earl wasn't fired. He became a distinguished professor. He, he didn't teach, he didn't do anything. In fact, he practically never showed up, but he was a distinguished professor. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, he was out of the way, so to speak. And uh, the faculty uh, voted to, uh, put in Joe Foster, who was a biochemist, as the next head of the department. And Joe Foster, he was from Iowa State too, by the way. He got his degree in biochemistry out at Iowa State. A real decent fellow. Joe was a very decent guy. And uh, he, he became then the department head. And uh, we were free of Earl McBee, who later on left to say the least, he, I don't know, he, he divorced, left, whatever. Um, but anyway, Joe Foster became head, and I remember Joe telling me, he said, Bob, I really think you should have been the head, but you were an organic chemist. And uh, that's why, see, Earl B was an organic chemist, mm. and uh, he didn't think that uh, <laughs> Joe, didn't think that was quite right. Uh, he, he, <laughs> not an organic chemist. So incidentally, organic chemistry in those days was really potent, headed by H.C. Brown. Brown, it, Herb would not go with us to Haas's office. There were 30, some of us went over there. H.C. Brown refused. And later on he said, look, I can win the Nobel Prize, and I don't intend to jeopardize that. I wouldn't be part of it. Well, Earl thought A.C. Brown was really great. I remember we get a kind of a resignation letter from Earl said, now there's a real man. A.C. Brown's a real man. He didn't go over to the dean. Well, anyway. Uh, so Joe Foster took over, and uh, we began to hire some really very good people. And boy, when they would come through here, we would grill them. They'd go around, talk to everybody on the faculty. And boy, we hired just what we thought were top flight people. And uh, if, if after two years or so, they didn't pan out, we would let them go and hire somebody else that we thought, and ultimately, 
they built up really a very, very good faculty here. And uh, when Joe Foster uh, stepped down, lo and behold, I became the head of the Department of Chemistry, despite the fact that I was an organic chemist. <laughs> so that was a new world for me, an administrative job, if I ever saw one, because it was a large department. By that time, there was a huge the faculty were, I think, around 40 members or so, and lots of students taking chemistry, a lot of graduate students, undergraduate students. What a job that was. And uh, when I, I took over that job somewhat what reluctantly. Year, what year would that have been? Was that about 19, oh, let me see. I, uh, about 1972 or okay. thereabouts, okay. I, I took over the job. And uh, at first I said, well, I'm going to divide my time. Half day I'll spend down in the main office, and the other half day I'll spend up in my own office to direct my research students. So if they wanted to see me, they had to see me in the mornings. Well, it, it did, <laughs> didn't work out. There were just too many problems in the department. And so my research began to suffer and I became a re very reluctant administrator, but I, I was going to do the very best I could. It, that's the way I was. Everything I did, I did my very best. And uh, so I, I had real problems. Everybody would have problems. It was interesting to me. I had a lot of friends on the faculty, but once I became department head, I was a different guy. I was now an administrator, and I was no longer, well, they look rather, you know, sideways at me. I'm now an administrator, and am I your friend or not your friend? And that was a very interesting transformation, I would see, with a lot of these guys. But uh, anyway, uh, I did the best I could. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I ran into one nasty problem. Joe Foster had hired a guy by the name of Frank Fong, F-O-N-G, who was, and he hired him as a full professor. I don't remember where Frank came from, but he came with very good recommendations. And he was the heart of, oh, he gave Joe Foster fits. He would be in the main office half of the time, pounding the desk and getting concessions from Joe. He'd get, he'd get his salary raised. He wanted this and he wanted that. And Joe would give, it most, give most of a twin what he wanted. And the faculty became infuriated with this guy, Fong. And Fong would run over to the president's office and tell the president what he wanted. Hubdi was no longer, Hubdi stepped out in 1970, as I remember it. Just in 70, 71 after. And Bierman. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Hansen came yeah, in. No, Hansen. Hansen was president there right. for a while, yeah. And uh, during that interval, by the way, uh, oh yeah, Haas was moved up from dean of science to provost. And I, I, boy, Phil was a, really a friend of mine. Uh, he was my boss, of course, as head of the chemistry department. He was dean of science. There were about five departments in the dean of science, and chemistry was one of them. Chemistry, physics, computer science, I don't know what all, bio, biological sciences. And Phil really helped me. Boy, that phone would ring my phone would ring on my desk in the morning. Hello, Bob? Yeah. Oh, this is Phil. He liked to call himself Phil, despite the name of Felix. He wanted to be called Phil. This is Phil. Uh, I got about $1,500 here, but I need it spent right away. Uh, can you uh, 
Hi, tomorrow morning, uh, send me some projects that you could use $1,500 on. Well, I'd have a whole stack of things there, and I would collect, send a bill, Haas, and I would get the money. Uh, you know, this, but I, I really appreciated Phil so much. Um, and one day, I really got a phone call from him. He said, Bob, we had, incidentally, we by that time had put an addition, the Weatherall addition, onto the chemistry building. But there wasn't enough money. And the, the fifth floor was not finished off. It was just rough. All the plumbing was just roughed in, and that, that was that. But Phil called and said, uh, Bob, I uh, got enough money to fill, to finish off the fifth floor of the chemistry building, but I asked only one thing from you, and that is that you turn over one of the labs in there to biology. His name was Koffler, Henry Koffler was head of biology, and also quite a, quite a, capable, competent fellow, a good friend. I liked him a lot. And uh, he said, Koffler's got so many undergraduates over there, we don't have lab space. He said, nah. he said, you could even give us one of your poor labs. I don't care. He said, just one lab. Phil, that's a deal. I get the whole fifth floor and I, you wouldn't believe it. There were some of the chemistry guys who were opposed to even giving them one room. I mean, Nothing was easy when you were head of the department. Sure, I mean, right. I had to argue with these guys. What's going room, you know? Anyway, uh, so be it. Uh, so we did finish off that uh, fifth floor, and we finished it off in good style. Uh, and boy, they we filled that up right away. Yeah. And in the meanwhile, Haas went on to be uh, provost and that opened up the head of Dean of Science. And they called me over, I remember, to Hubdy Hall, and they wanted me to be the Dean of Science. And boy, did they twist my arm. I mean, Hanson and Haas, they twisted my arm. <sighs> and I didn't know. I said, no. I said, I've just had enough administration. I said, I, I can't take it anymore. I said, I want to go back to teaching and directing research. No, I, I don't want to be the Dean of Science. So I said, no. And uh, they brought in a young guy by the name of Alan Clark. A-L-A-N, Alan Clark. Very young fellow. He was from Brown University. Uh, they brought him in as Dean of Science. And so in my latter days there as head of the department, I would report to Alan Clark. But he was a decent guy. I had no trouble with him. And uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to stop this for a second. Um, okay. 77. Okay. I told uh, Alan Clark, I said, Alan, I've had it. I'm stepping down. He didn't want me to, but I said, sure. I'm going to, I'm going back to teaching and science. And you know, just as well as I did, because just about that time, my wife developed colon cancer. And this, needless to say, my, I was in a turmoil. Sure. She had an operation locally, and thank God she, <laughs> last five years, she lasted 20, 25 years. She got over it, but that was a very hectic time for I'm me. Sure. And uh, I went back. And, you know, I uh, tried to teach and direct research, but I, I could no longer get good graduate students anymore. And later on, somebody told me, you know, you're too old, Bob. These younger guys, when they come in, they, they tend to gravitate toward the younger people. And I said, oh, well, it could be. And, uh, so anyway, uh, I about 1984, uh, I announced that we had to give five years notice that we were going to retire. And as I said, I had a mandatory retirement date of uh, 1990. 
I think. And, uh, but I, by 1984, I was exhausted. I had had all these experiences. And, uh, so I announced that I was going to be retired in five years. And so I stopped taking graduate students. And by 1989, I stepped out. I was just exhausted. <laughs> And I, I said to my wife, do you mind if I just retire one year early? <laughs> she said, no. no. And so that was the end of my career. I'd like to, just one last thing. Sure. Um, this is, a, I don't know much about this. This is put out now by the College of Science. Okay. See, this says spring, Here, summer, I'll turn this off, that's okay. And look at on this page, <laughs> I, didn't, I don't get this publication, believe it or not. Well, one of my sons called me up and said, Dad, do you get that book on the inside? See, all my kids went to Purdue. I said, no, I don't get it. He said, oh, there's a nice article in there about you. It's very short. You can read just the last. How nice. <laughs> you know, I'd like to make a I, I, What I will do... I will if I. You can take that if you want. I think I. I booked. No, no, and then I'll make the copy and return it to you. Oh, that will be fine. Fine, no problem. I want to thank you very much for this. You've been really good. I really learned a lot. You have a good time. Really (laughs) nice. But.